it's important to remember just how improbable the fall of the Berlin Wall appeared to the people who were living it at the time. One of my favorite stories is in a certain US government agency, some people were debating whether the Berlin Wall would ever fall. A discussion interrupted by news that it was coming down. The foreign policy establishment believed that the realistic doctrine, the doctrine of realism for the Cold War, meant that we had to accept the division of Europe as inevitable. And this was by 1989, this was baked into our policy. 1956, we said nasty things about the Soviets crushing the Hungarian Revolution. In 1961, Kennedy gives a great speech about the Berlin Wall, but he actually defends West Berlin. His vision didn't extend into East Berlin. 1968, Lyndon Johnson doesn't even say much about the invasion of Czechoslovakia. Nixon's detente was based on a tacit assumption that the lines of control in Europe, where they were drawn by Mr. Stalin in 1945, would remain forever. The fall of the Berlin Wall followed the establishment of a non-communist government in Poland. The Poles were first. They were first out of the box in 1989. And the Polish success triggered the Hungarian communists to quickly negotiate a surrender of power. That, in turn, helped trigger the Velvet Revolution. And all of this brought the end of the Berlin Wall. The failure of communism was the underlying factor in all of this. Detente, Nixon's detente, accepting the division of Europe. Kissinger's detente would have worked out fine for the Soviets if communism had worked at all, but it didn't work. And the rot by the mid-1980s was inescapable. So Gorbachev comes to power in 1985, and he's trying to save the Soviet Union by reforming it. And it was an impossible task. But to attempt it, he needed a better relationship with the West. So the option of another martial law in Poland, or another Czechoslovak invasion, or another Hungarian, bloody Hungarian crackdown, as in 1956, were possible. They had the guns. <laughs> they had all the guns. But it would have been costly. And the Soviet system is already not performing. So Gorbachev is trying to reform it, and the Poles, the Solidarity people, Lech Walesa, they realize that the bars on that jail were rusty. One big shove and we're out. We're done. No one in Washington believed it was possible. The notion that something big would happen in 1989 was regarded as delusional. I mean, I know because at the time I was the Polish desk officer. I was reading all the reports from the US Embassy in Warsaw, which nailed it. They absolutely nailed it. And I believed it partly because my own sense told me that the Polish communists had lost control of the politics in the country. I mean, they were about to ask the Poles for what amounted to a referendum on communism with a Polish pope in Rome. Like, are you serious? What do you think the Poles are going to do? But nobody in Washington believed the embassy, and, and I was the only one who was reading the stuff without throwing it in the figurative wastebasket. It didn't matter what Washington felt. The Poles grabbed history, and they ran with it. And all through the spring and summer, momentum in Poland was accelerating toward a momentous change. Now, the first people who actually believed this besides me were the people in the incoming Bush administration. One young director at the NSC named Condoleezza Rice came over to visit me in February 1989. And to my surprise, she didn't laugh in my face when I told her that things in Poland might develop in a rather dramatic fashion soon. And she was the one who helped convince George H.W. Bush to put his weight behind the Polish negotiations between the Solidarity and the Communists, which he did. 
And that might have made the, the crucial difference because George H.W. Bush's combination of strategic vision and tactical reserve, his rhetorical understatement, just nailed it. It was perfect because he didn't want to dance on the, you know, on the grave of communism, but he wanted to push history forward. Now, by the time the Berlin Wall falls, Solidarity is already, already has the prime minister position in Poland, and you could see the way things were developing. The question for the Americans was, do we remember, do, well, did we remember what we fought World War II in Europe to achieve? Because the Atlantic Charter is based on Wilson's 14 points, and it's not just idealism. That's how it's taught in school. Wilsonian idealism, that's, it's, that's not right. Wilson's vision is the rough, crude, rough first draft of an American grand strategy for the 20th century, the American century. It outlines a free world rather than spheres of influence, not because we're idealistic or believe in charity, but because we think that's gonna make us really rich. We won't lower ourselves to a sphere of influence. We want it all. But it's not an empire. It's a rules-based world that just happens to give us the advantage because that's what we're good at. It unleashes Yankee ingenuity. And that's the basis of the Atlantic Charter that Roosevelt shoves down Churchill's throat because that's basically an anti-imperial document. And Churchill has trouble swallowing it, but no matter, he does. Now that's not where Roosevelt ends up. He ends up reluctantly agreeing to Yalta, which is a tacit recognition of Soviet, of Soviet occupation of the eastern third of Europe. But that vision doesn't leave us, and in 1989 we start returning to it. Well, Reagan did before that, rhetorically. But <laughs> even the Reagan administration didn't believe Reagan when he said that communism was doomed. It was George H.W. Bush who puts the Wilson, 14 points, Atlantic Charter, Harry Truman vision, and then Reagan vision into practice. And then Clinton, who extends it to Central Europe. Irony of ironies, Republicans and Democrats serving the same strategic vision. So yeah, the Berlin Wall, best thing ever. And why is it good for the United States? Why does it matter? Because we fought two world wars in the Cold War, and we did so so we, so we would not have to fight a third world war. Because a divided Europe wasn't very good for us. There was an alternative theory. The isolationists, the America First crowd, argued before Pearl Harbor that Europe European security had nothing to do with us, and we were, it should be indifferent as to whether Hitler, Stalin, or <laughs> Neville Chamberlain came out on top. And look what that led to. You know, Omaha Beach, Dresden, the Holocaust, the Cold War, the Iron Curtain, lots and lots of dead people. The free world works for the United States because we realized that an open rules-based world that favored freedom was going to be good for us. It would play to our, as I said, to our natural strength. That's a hell of an achievement. We actually achieved what we set out to achieve. Not in the time we wanted, not without the hypocrisies, errors, blunders along the way, but we got there. So when I think of the fall of the Berlin Wall, there's a lot of history behind that. Americans and others died for the vision of a united Europe. Not because, as some would say in this administration, we were suckers, but because we as Americans knew our interests and our values would advance together or not at all. So we built a free world after 1989, tried to extend that 
to the newly self-liberated parts of Europe, offered a place to Russia, and now someone would tell me, well, look, it doesn't look so good now. American politics, Brexit, politics in Central Europe, you know, nationalism in Europe, everybody's mad at everybody else. Sure, I get it. And my answer would be, so who promised you paradise on Earth? Did we forget our basic lessons about the imperfectibility of human beings? Look, I was thinking about this anniversary the other day, and I was thinking, well, rather, rather embarrassing to say, but Immanuel Kant's famous saying, from the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing is ever made. What that means is, like, don't expect too much, man. Not from people. But that didn't stop Kant from writing his great book, The Theory of Perpetual Peace Between Republics. That's sort of the first vision in Europe of a free world, right? Perpetual peace between republics. Sound familiar? Immanuel Kant would probably say, yeah, go for it. But don't expect too much. But go for it. So when I think of the fall of the Berlin Wall, yeah, go for it. As long as you're not impatient and don't expect human perfection at the end.